On a crisp March morning in 1453, a young man sits on horseback and beholds the city of Constantinople. Its ancient walls are freshly repaired and its battlements bristle with rows of gunners and archers. If he stood a little closer, he might have heard the constant low chanting of the clergy, drawing on the power of their heathen god for the battle to come. This city is his birthright. It has infected his dreams since he was a boy. He has no doubt that prophecy has called him to this task, to conquer the unconquerable city. Behind him his legions are forming up, tens of thousands of warriors drawn from every corner of his empire, the Beyliks of deepest Anatolia and the Christian lands to the north. He has engineers, sappers, a vast fleet, and the most powerful cannons the continent has ever seen. And still he knows there are whispers. History called upon him once already and found him wanting. He knows if he fails now, he will wake in a few weeks to find a well-placed knife between his ribs. Behind the ancient walls, Mehmed's foe has gathered all his strength yet remaining for one final stand. Mercenaries, renegades, even his own faithless cousin. Even as shadows of their former selves, they are still Romans. He signals to his artillery. The sky erupts in fire and the world holds its breath. Welcome back to the Weird Medieval Guys podcast. I'm Olivia, and this is Aaron, a bay from one of my vassal states. What do you think of my suit of armor? Um, I think and it's my pointy helmet. absolutely marvelous. What do you think of my scimitar? You look extremely It has Bishmila on it. Wow. On and the blade. On the blade. That's going to compromise the integrity of the metalworking. That's a very poor choice. But it looks cool. Replace it with a more utilitarian weapon. That's Make going me. to crack in battle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's and speaking of battle, this is it. Speaking of battle, we've got one on the horizon, but not too close on the horizon. We've got a little bit of historical landscape to cover. Yes, and by the way, I should say this is not something that we've ever said before on this show, but I am going to implore you. <laughs> <laughs> this is part 2 of a of a two-part series. It will vastly improve the experience if you've listened to part one. Yes. I know that I said at the start of part one that that was like scene setting and, and set up. Yeah. But to have a payoff, you need a setup, all right? So just, exactly. Just bear with, all right? Would you watch Star Wars episode four without watching episode three first? I can't even imagine the idea. Inconceivable. <laughs> well, speaking of prequels, I think we need to take a step back um, from that scene in 1453 and explain how that young man got to where he is. Yeah, I think just to kind of recap where we're at right yeah. now, when we left you in our last episode, mm -hmm. we left you after a man named Osman, the founder of a dynasty of Turks, had a dream, a dream pointing him towards Constantinople. Now, what we've been building up to is the convergence of sort of several forces on Constantinople. Um, but I think, yeah, before we before we get to sort of the good good, I think we do <laughs> need to go back to Osman, to that historical context, and take a look at how this dream actually came to pass. Yes. Before the Roman Empire, before Constantinople, there was the steppe. A vast, vast territory stretching all the way from Ukraine in the west all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Now, this territory that unites Eurasia is this 
is off is often I think treated by historians of Europe as this kind of liminal space, this path, this place that you pass through to get to the the exciting stuff in uh, in China and Japan, etc. You might have there might be like guys with faces on their chests somewhere along the way, but it's basically a place that you 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 want to get through to get to the good stuff. Now, in fact, the the Eurasian step is better understood as a sort of petri dish of civilizations, most of them nomadic, which just sort of spent centuries traveling around its enormous expanse, uh, trading with each other, uh, fighting each other, absorbing one another, and occasionally spilling out into the sedentary societies to the west and east of them. And one of those societies was a people that we now call the Oz Turks. So being a, a sort of nomadic, inventive, um, kind of marauding person of the steppe, that's all well and fine for a bit. But eventually empires are growing around you, large nations are carving up chunks of land, and everyone wants a piece of the pie. Yeah, I mean, I the way that I always like to talk about it is that, like, for Central Asian societies, moving to like moving into Europe is kind of like moving to the suburbs <laughs> of 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 the world. It's like you put down roots, you you start doing like sedentary farming, <laughs> yeah. and so eventually, um, eventually the Oz Turks migrate down first into Persia, and then when they take over Persia, they end up settling. I should say settling alongside, in many cases, the existing. Uh, Greek and Armenian peoples of that region. Anatolia, for context, is this kind of strip, this peninsular strip of land uh, between the between the Bosphorus and the Euphrates, which makes up the vast majority of the territory of modern day Turkey. Yeah, and it's a very good place to settle if you can get kind of a foothold because it's this area of commerce, it's an area of relatively rich natural resources. Mm. And so even as early as the 11th century, you see Turkic peoples from the steppe establishing settlements in this Anatolian area. Yeah, and they're kind of like in the in the high medieval period, Anatolia is kind of a bit of a wild west in that no because the because you have the 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 Persians on one side and the um and the Romans on the other side neither power is um is powerful enough to kind of dominate the region and so much like Italy at essentially the same time which was sort of which where you had the pope in the south and the emperor in the north um you get this constellation of very small uh very small states called Beylix, after the Bays or the lords of those states. And it's this incredibly interesting period of, of cultural development. You know, you get, again, much, much like Italy, you get this mix of like small principalities, but also there are these merchant republics. There's a, there is a, you know, medieval Ankara is ruled by a group called the, the Ahi Brotherhood or the Brotherhood of Fellowship, who are this merchant guild. It's a fascinating period. I but, like that. That's like the friendship club, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the gang of pals. <laughs> so are these guys like, you know, following the West, Wild West metaphor, are these guys like the oil barons of the scene, you know, carving up the territory? Probably, probably not as much. Do they uh, have monocles? <laughs> <laughs> probably not as much money to be made as, as an oil baron. But yeah, these are, these are, it's the, the comparison, I think, to like enterprising, like, um, political entrepreneurs who step into um, this kind of unsettled territory where alliances and power structures are not very well established and kind of carve out their own fiefdoms is exactly right. Yes. And one of these medieval oil barons is a guy named Osman. So Osman was this sort of mid-level uh, bay who, you know, established his own little fiefdom in, in Anatolia at the end of the 13th century, going into the 14th century. And Osman was a very effective politician and a very effective leader and was able to sort of cultivate a lot of allies. And so under him and his successors, his Beylik gradually becomes the most powerful force in Anatolia. 
powerful enough to take the fight to one of the great powers of the region, the Roman Empire. Osman is also known as Osman Ghazi, and this word Ghazi is kind of like a Turkic term for almost like a, a swashbuckler. It's kind of hard to describe in Free one booter, word. I think, is, yeah. the, is the way that I'd translate A little it. bit. A little bit like, and I promise after this I will lay the Wild West metaphor <laughs> um, to rest, but a little bit like the kind of cowboy of the era. Mm. Um, the cowboy sort of pirate king. I think probably, <laughs> probably terrestrial pirate is almost like a better way of putting it. But it's this idea of someone who's, you know, kind of a, a fierce but just, you know, warlike leader. He's kind a bad of a, boy. A marauder, yeah, a exactly. A bad boy with a heart of gold. Exactly, and I think this kind of Ghazi culture and this ideal of the Ghazi is an influential one in the cultural development of the Ottomans, even as they settle down, because their leaders and sort of their militarists still fancy themselves as these kind of, you know, go-getter guys who are, you know ready to to go out and and claim their fortune Mm. with a bit of charm and charisma one of the things that i should say about the about the um the ottomans and the wider sort of turkish elite and the and the bays at this point is that they are as they sort of spend these generations upon generations settling in anatolia they're also forming alliances with you know with with local greek and armenian lords and with the roman emperors as well and so they are quite literally marrying a lot of Europeans. And so they become gradually more Europeanized. They sort of become more exposed to, to you know, classical history and, you know, and, and Christian theology as well, even though they are overwhelmingly Muslim. That's never really presented, I think, much of an issue for any religion. I mean, we've talked a bit before about how Christians created a sense of continuity between themselves and the classical world Mm. by translating and teaching and adapting sources from the classical world. And you see a very similar phenomenon with the Turks, even though they are Muslims, you know, they're big patrons of the arts and of scholarship. And you see this culture of sponsoring translations um, and works based on classical sources and having them translated into vernacular languages um, like Turkish and this kind of, you know, consolidation of um, of arts and of learning and of the classical worlds. And yeah, I think, you know, culturally in general, even though there are people who originated from the steppe, yeah, they absorb a lot of influences along the way. Yeah, they, they've been, first they get Persianized and then they get sort of Christianized in a way. And I think it's it's no coincidence that in as part of that process, one of the ideas that filters into the imagination of these increasingly Europeanized uh, Turkish elites is the image of Constantinople. Now, probably we won't spend a lot of time going into what that image is because we just spent an hour and 50 yes. minutes on it. Um, but suffice to say, it is this city that is fated with great, both um, great theological significance, but also with associations of tremendous wealth, even though um, after the Fourth Crusade in 1214, it is very much a sort of shattered, ruined husk of yes. itself, but it still has this cultural pull. Exactly. They are, the, 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 the Ottomans are being drawn, like everybody else, like the Vikings, um, like the Chinese, like everybody, towards the, the, this black hole, essentially, of culture. And that's, I don't think that it's a coincidence that that's the moment at which Osman, when imagining his his state and his family expanding and growing in power. I don't think it's a coincidence that the image that he fixates on in that famous dream is the image of Constantinople. Yeah, absolutely. I think you can almost imagine, and this is purely my own speculation coming through here, but you can almost imagine that these couple centuries of misfortune have almost <laughs> sort of you know, stoked um, the fires of intrigue surrounding Constantinople, that it might be this place that could be scooped up by someone enterprising enough and transformed into its former someone glory. Someone gazy enough. Yeah, exactly. Or even something a bit beyond that. I mean, even today, we still 
have you know legends embedded in our culture about places like you know Timbuktu or Machu Picchu and there's just you know it's a very romantic idea this place of former glory so you can absolutely definitely imagine how this was weighing on the minds of the Turks and to to emphasize one more time um part of why this desire for Constantinople seemed like a natural extension of their empire and a natural way to expand um, it is just important to remember that these people are very culturally European as well as Asian, and by the time of Osman, they've been settled in Anatolia for quite some time, and so this isn't... Well, they've been settled longer than... the, the long, They've been settled in Anatolia longer than the United States has existed. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's the timeline that you should be imagining here. Since they've been settled in Anatolia, the Roman Empire has kind of, like, fallen and then, you know, been brought back. Well, barely. Essentially, <laughs> you know. <laughs> brought back in a sort of, in a in a desiccated form, but yeah. Yeah, so you can kind of imagine, like, the same way that you might hear your neighbors fighting through the wall and think, <laughs> what's up with that? Maybe Osman and the Turks were kind of <laughs> sitting in Anatolia, <laughs> getting kind of word of what was going on in Constantinople, thinking, do I need to call the cops? Except there's no cops, and it's, you know, should I go conquer that place? Who's the emperor this week? <laughs> exactly. So by the mid to late 14th century, uh, the Ottomans, as we sort of start calling them from this point onwards, so the House of Osman, or Osmanolu in Turkish, the Ottomans are strong enough, have consolidated enough power in Anatolia to make a play against one of the big powers of the region. And they go for the Romans, because the Romans are, as we've said before, just a shadow of their former selves. They have been, um, they've stitched their empire back together after the after the Fourth Crusade, but it is on incredibly shaky ground. Um, there is no, like, the economy is in the toilet, essentially. Uh, the army is incredibly disorganized. And so under the Sultan Bayezid I, who gets the name Bayezid the Thunderbolt, which is just such a cruel name. <laughs> if anyone wants to give Aaron an equally cool nickname. Please, you know. comment below. <laughs> um, Bayezid becomes known as the Thunderbolt because he strikes incredibly quickly and incredibly brutally against the Roman Empire. And after a few major victories, uh, resistance really starts to crumble. So Bayezid's armies will show up outside of a city, and the Roman officials of the city will be given an ultimatum. And the ultimatum will go something like this. Under the Sharia, the Islamic law, the people of the book, so Christians and Jews, are to be given an opportunity to submit themselves before the armies of Allah. Right? If they take that chance, then they are allowed to go in, they are allowed to go in peace. They are not to be harmed in any way. Um, it's essentially the sort of medieval Islamic version of the Geneva Convention. You don't fuck with people who have accepted your, your sovereignty. If, however, you choose to resist, all be like all bets are off. There are no rules. You can be enslaved. You can be massacred. You can Scorched be... earth. Exactly. I think it's worth mentioning that if they did choose to um, submit, that didn't mean that they were going to get like a pat on the back and be treated identically to the Muslims. But it did mean that they were going to mostly be spared and maybe have some rights stripped. But well, I mean, mostly, like what mostly would they would, mostly they would just have to pay a tax. Yeah, called the jizya. Now that's not the happiest solution, but imagine yourself in the shoes of a Roman official in a small city in this period. You know, you can you can either submit to the guy who will you know make you pay a bit more tax. Or you can hold out hope that the just decaying yeah. <laughs> corpse of the Roman Empire will rouse itself from its slumber and um, and come and defend you with, you know, what little resources it has left. Yeah. Which, after Bayezid wins a few victories, places just start surrendering to them. Because why would you not take that deal yeah. under the circumstances? Why would you not... Why earth would you choose you know surrounded you know outnumbered 10 to 1 why would you hold out so Bayezid manages to conquer most of the roman possessions 
in the Balkans, leaving basically Constantinople and its surroundings and sort of southern Greece. This is hugely alarming, shall we say, to the Christian powers of the Latin world, who, while there's not a lot of love lost between the, the uh, Latin Christians and the Orthodox Christians, still don't like it when uh, Muslim armies win battles. And so in uh, 1396, there's a crusade launched to uh, stop the Ottomans from encircling Constantinople. It's led by a guy called uh, Sigismund of Hungary. And in the, in the crusading army is a very young Conrad Kaiser who gets away by the skin of his teeth, which most of the crusading armies don't because it's a utter slaughter. You might remember Conrad Kaiser, by the way, from episode four, in which we discussed him as the inventor of such things as... Giant egg. <laughs> knife ladder. <laughs> <laughs> knife, uh, knife sword. Scoop a suit. <laughs> knife, knife. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, and that, and that battle is the, is the origin of his lifelong... <laughs> hatred that he would then have for Sigismund of Hungary, yep. uh, which he would take t very much to his grave. But that is a story for another day. Yes. So, so, so the Latin, the Latin crusade against the Ottomans fails. By 1402, Bayezid is literally at the gates of Constantinople, uh, you know, besieging it with everything he's got. And it looks like the city will fall until the Romans get bailed out from a very, very, very unexpected source. The Mongols, completely unrelated, <laughs> uh, in the, in the, um, far to the east, uh, Timur, or as we call him in the West, Tamerlane, the, you know, terrifying Mongol warlord just sweeps in and, attack and starts attacking Ottoman possessions in eastern Anatolia. Bayezid goes, oh crap, and rushes off to, you know, and to face down the obviously much bigger threat. And so the Ottoman army and the Mongol army face each other at the Battle of Ankara, and the Ottomans just get washed. Like... Yep. It's not a, when you've. I mean, to be fair, when you've been mostly fighting Greek cities that enthusiastically surrender for the last <laughs> for the last six Definitely. years, you kind of lose a bit of your edge. Yeah, the Ottomans lose. Bayezid is captured, and subsequently dies, which sets off a ten-year-long, um, incredibly complex succession crisis. Which, where there are many different claimants to the Ottoman throne. This is, I think, and we'll come back to this again, a big part of why sieging, although if it goes well for the attacker, can be basically an easy layup trying to take these, you know, poorly defended, sparsely populated cities, it is also a massive investment on the part of the seizure, because seizure, that doesn't sound right, the siege um, campaigner, because... I like seizure. <laughs> it sounds too much like seizure. I don't like seizures. No, me neither. Um, you know, because you're you're basically leaving your your backside unguarded. You're basically increasing the chances of being caught with your pants down <laughs> while you're cavorting around, kind of like picking up cities and adding them <laughs> to your collection. You know, that's taking a lot of resources and a lot of men, and possibly those are resources and troops that are being diverted from other areas that might also need to be defended. Um, so just saying that to emphasize sieging is even in a decaying empire. It's not always easy. No, it's incredibly time and labor intensive. Anyways, carry on. So eat an apricot. Our boy... Um, I'm eating the apricot. Oh, he's, yeah. Um, he's eating an apricot. I used to, like... When I... We've talked before about how we both come from granola families. Yeah. How many how many dried apricots do you think you ate? Oh my a year? god! I was thinking I was thinking about that because I was thinking about snacks that I ate as a child that were not snack food. Like when you would, because I was I was putting flaked almonds in the rice, and I was thinking about how when I was a child, like we wouldn't have snacks, so I just eat like a loose fistful of like flaked almonds or yeah. like 
raw walnut halves or like yeah apricots like. that was like that wasn't a not a snack thing for us that was just like this is what your snack food is because a flaked almond is so unsatisfying like a whole <laughs> almond is fine but a flaked almond is it's like it's like know. dust in my mouth exactly so anyways back to the ottoman succession crisis yes god well the reason why i haven't been why i have been talking about almonds instead of Ottoman succession crises is because this is fiendishly complicated. <laughs> One of the issues with the Ottomans is that every single male member of their family has an equal right to the throne. So every time there is a uh, there is a, a vacancy at the top, uh, you get essentially, as I was explaining to you a couple weeks ago, you get the first. It's basically the first scene of Stardust. Versus yeah. a bunch of people pushing each other out of windows. <laughs> um, so to kick, to cut a wildly complicated story short, by the end of um, the ten-year-long succession crisis, two things happen. First thing, a guy by the name of Mehmed comes to power and becomes the head of the Ottoman dynasty. Second of all, uh, one of his rivals, a young boy by the name of Orhan Celebi, um, gets essentially ransomed to the Romans. They the Ottomans agree to get get this kid out of the picture, <laughs> yeah. essentially, by sending him to live as a glorified hostage of the Roman court with, you know, with a retinue and, like, people in his pay in exchange for the Ottomans handing the Romans a big fat chunk of money every year. Yeah. Which the Romans quite appreciated because they had been broke for about a century. <laughs> Now, Mehmed eventually dies, and his power transfers to his son, Murad. Now, Murad is a very interesting character who we don't have much time to get into. He's one of the only Ottoman sultans, I think, to ever abdicate the throne voluntarily. And nobody really knows why, as well. There's debate about it. Some say it's because his eldest son died. And other people say it's because he really just did not like ruling. Yeah. But the relevant thing to say about... Murad is that in the 1420s, he slightly unenthusiastically besieges Constantinople again, and then signs a peace treaty with the Romans that, you know, promises eternal friendship, etc., 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 but in practice basically makes the Romans, um, who are essentially just now Constantinople plus a couple of possessions in Greece, makes them essentially a vassal state. Just to remind you of the geography, this means that they have, like, if I'm correct, you know, Constantinople is literally to the east, Ottoman Empire, to yeah. the west, also Ottoman Empire, to the south, Mediterranean, yeah. and to the north, the Black Sea. So, yeah. like, they are boxed in. They are literally surrounded on all sides. So, getting a peace treaty and a big fat check every year to take care of that guy's rogue nephew is an okay deal Yeah, <laughs> under the circumstances. Now, as I said before, Murad... Um, does not he, eventually he loses his interest in ruling whatever the reason and abdicates in favor of his teenage son not teenage 12 years old 12 year old is teenager no because it doesn't end with teen 12 doesn't end with teen 13 that's a teen all right socrates <laughs> <laughs> a teenager is a featherless bipedal under the age of <laughs> the age of 12. <laughs> Oh, that's Diogenes. <laughs> so yes, in, I believe, 1444, yes. Murad says, I'm not feeling rulership anymore. Hey, Mehmed, my son who didn't die, who I am possibly not that interested in because we don't interact that much, <laughs> but you're friends with Dracula, <laughs> which we've mentioned before, and I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, you, you are the sultan now, and Mehmed is 12 years old, and basically... This whole operation goes about as well as can be expected, handing the reins to a 12-year-old. Yeah, so almost immediately, the Christian powers say, right, this is it, this is our moment. They're being run by a child. Let's let's strike while the iron is hot. Um, so, you know, you chaos erupts, essentially, in the western half of the Ottoman Empire. You have, you know... In the, in, in the Carpathians, the legendary Hungarian warrior John Hunyadi is fighting Ottoman forces across the, across the mountains. In Albania, Skanderbeg, formerly an Ottoman vassal, declares independence and manages to push 
Ottoman forces all the way out of Albania. And the Pope sees all of this and says, I think it's time for a crusade, lads. <laughs> Let's finish him off. So Hunyadi and the King of Poland descend upon upon the Ottomans from the north with this vast Christian army headed for headed for the, the, the throat of the Ottoman Empire. And Mehmed, who again is a child, freaks out. Yes. <laughs> and he calls his dad. Yeah. And he sa he says, in one of the most incredible letters, I think, ever written by a reigning monarch. He says, if you are the sultan, come and lead your armies. If I am the sultan, I hereby order you to come and lead my armies. Which, yeah, it goes incredibly hard. Um, <laughs> but if you think about the implication, it's like, dad, come pick me up. I'm yeah, scared. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Murad begrudgingly sort of comes out of retirement for one last job and leads the Ottoman forces to battle the Crusaders at Varna, wipes the floor with the Crusaders again. Um, you know, Hunyadi makes it out, but the, the King of Poland is killed. And it's a it's an embarrassing episode for Christendom overall, I'd say, the Crusade of Varna. Now you're zero for two on Crusades that are meant to, like, bring down the Ottoman Empire. But it's also an embarrassing kind of episode, I think, for the Ottomans, you know. Eventually, Murad returns to the throne. Yeah. They, they try to put it behind themselves for a couple of years. And yeah, they, they do successfully put that genie back in the bottle, yeah. I think, for a bit. But Murad, he only lives a few more years after, um, after Varna, and by 1451... He dies, yeah. and uh, it's a sign. It's a sign. The clock says fourteen fifty-three. There was a mouse or something. <laughs> I freaked out. I freaked out. The the oven <sighs> clock says fourteen fifty-three. That's beautiful. Anyway. One thing I wanted to mention as well is that even though 12-year-olds aren't great at ruling, as Mehmed showed to us, um, he did make it through partially with the very heavy management of some of the sort of elder officials um, and senior members of his father's government who basically were willing to sort of, you know, do some string pulling and some puppeteering so that the whole place didn't completely fall apart. Something that Mehmed, I think we'll return to this, resented, you know, even beyond this first reign that he had. So by 1451, when he resumes power after his father dies, he's only 18 at that point. But I think I think he's old enough now that I think we can we can take a measure of his character. So let's talk about Mehmed the man. Yes. Or the boy man. Yes. <laughs> What's his deal? How often does he think about ancient Rome? Literally all Every the time. Every <laughs> day. He's a huge nerd. He loves... I mean, he's, he's, he's such an interesting character because he's half Serbian, first of all. Like, Murad's, Murad was married to this Serbian princess. So he's, half, he's like Christian on his mother's side. And I even read there are allegations that he would pray every night to an icon of the Virgin Mary, which is such a slanderous thing to say about a Muslim that I think it might be true. Wow. It's so specific that yeah. it... And also it tracks for his character because he's obsessed with Rome and the ancient Greek world. And he, he he's, he's a fanboy. And basically. because he probably either never knew or only barely knew his own actual mother... So you can imagine him trying to kind of, you know, fill that that role. Yeah. With the Virgin Mary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, many such cases. That's One all Christian I'll say. mom who will never leave you. <laughs> he loves, you know, he loves scholarship of the ancient world. He is, you know, by all accounts, a devout Muslim. Yeah. So you say he loves, uh, like, ancient Roman song. What else does he love? Arguably... <laughs> No, Se not arguably. <laughs> Most likely, <laughs> sex with men. <laughs> now, this is going to... You, if you listened all the way to the outro of our last episode, you will have heard me um, interrogating Aaron about, you know, how, wh why we haven't discussed this already. And I just wanted to say that, like, sources on specifically Mehmed are slightly spurious simply because most of them come from like greek people who were not necessarily his friends and also 
this might make some people upset because some people might think of this as historical revisionism, which is it's not, not. It's not in the slightest. It's, it's attested at the time. It's very well documented that the Ottoman Empire before Mehmed and after Mehmed had a pretty strong culture of what could be best described as pederasty mm. in sort of the ancient Greek sense, in that in a lot of Muslim states, women were kind of excluded from public life and were expected to be very private, very non-visible members of society. And this created this culture in which relationships between men, emotional relationships, were seen as much more deep and real and worth discussing and glamorizing and valorizing. You know, it was this kind of situation where the type of love and relationship that was seen as religiously correct wasn't something that you necessarily wanted to go writing like explicit or lovelorn poetry about. And so you ended up with this big artistic canon and, you know, also just culture in practice of emphasis on relationships between men and in particular men who also existed outside of this Muslim sort of sphere of, of culture. It's, yeah, there's a sort of fetishization of non-Muslim men and boys as Yes, well. and to an extent as well non-Muslim women, but because of the lesser emphasis on women as like a worthy object of affection, yeah, especially on men. And if, again, if you feel like you're going to write out a, you know, angry message in my Twitter DMs calling us woke, which has happened a few times already, <laughs> um, go and Google, look, look up Ottoman art of people, men having anal sex. <laughs> Browse all of that and then <laughs> come back and tell me that they didn't. And this doesn't, this isn't to say, oh, these guys were gay, because obviously, like, homosexuality in the modern sense doesn't really exist as a concept. But yeah. It's not, it's not a frame of reference. To Same sex attraction is still a thing, but it's not like they have a concept of gay and straight. Exactly. Anyways, one of the reasons why I touched on Ottoman poetry and sort of Ottoman artistic expressions of love between men is because many of our sources on Mehmed's sexuality come from Mehmed, who also wrote poetry. I assume, yeah, you knew this, yeah. under the name Avni, which means helper, I think, in Turkish. And I just want to show Aaron this Tumblr blog I found oh, with God. Mehmed's poetry on it. It's all in Comic Sans. It's, <laughs> it's pink. There's rainbow text. The, the forwards and backwards arrows are two interlocked male signs. Yes. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's read one. This one is called I Saw an Angel. And this is an English translation. I don't actually know who translated this one, um, but it goes like this. I saw an angel, a sun face, or this world's moon. Black hyacinth curls, smoky sights of lovers. An alluring cypress clad in black like the moon. In night of Franks whom his beauty rules. If your heart is not bound in the knot of heathen belt, you're no true believer, but a lost soul among lovers. His lips give life anew to those whom his glances kill. Just so, for that giver of life follows the way of Jesus. Avni, have no doubt, that beauty will one day be tame. For you are the ruler of Istanbul, and he the lord of Galata. So he was, he was sitting around all day fantasizing about Christian twinks. Yeah, he loved poetry and it's pretty much agreed upon that like his poetry wasn't that great. But... <laughs> uh, he had other talents. He had other talents. So essentially what you're saying is that Mehmed was a chaotic bisexual who was obsessed with ancient Greece and Rome. Sorry, I was just giving a quick pause there to give half of our listenership time to go, wow, he's literally me <laughs> to themselves. I know, I, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and
And um, to make things even better, one of his alleged lovers is Dracula's younger brother. Yes, Radu the Handsome. Who was known as Radu the Handsome. Yeah. And um, I mean, I don't bl- I, look. I don't blame him. They don't call him Radu the Mid. I mean, it's it's a fascinating story, and we touched on this a little bit in our vampires episode. And it almost feels like this episode. Now we're getting off track. It almost feels like this is this whole episode unto itself, but much in the same way that the Ottomans sent this guy to Constantinople as a hostage. One of the vassal states um, of Wallachia sent two of their princes to the Ottomans as sort of hostages. But, you know, when you're a royal hostage, you grow up in the palace and you become buddy-buddy with, um, you know, the the princes and the royal family and the royal households. And you might even have frequent passionate sex with them. Yeah, and so one of these hostages was Dracula. (laughs) (laughs) One of the other ones was the younger brother of Dracula, who was charmingly named Radu the Handsome, or nicknamed Radu the Handsome, who allegedly was one of Mehmed's lovers, and who, when Dracula, or Vlad Dracul, as I should say more properly, (laughs) left the Ottomans and launched his own rebellion, Radu stayed and converted to Islam and basically became besties with Mehmed. And they were roommates. Were roommates. And there's a great story about how Radu comes like riding into, um, I think it's Constantinople actually at some point after the siege. And it's like, you know, oh, you're not going to believe what my shitbag brother has been up to. <laughs> and Mehmed takes his hand and guides him up onto, like, the the plinth where the royal throne is and beckons his servants and says, you know, bring this man some fine robes and a throne and, like, puts him next to him and is like, now you are the prince of Wallachia and we are going to go and retake your, <laughs> you know, your lands from your brother. It's very gay in every sense of the word. Yeah. So not long after uh, Mehmed takes the throne for the second time, um, he gets an emissary from the still extant Roman Empire with a very unusual demand. But before we explain what that demand was, I think it's important that we give a little context as to what's been happening in Constantinople at the very same time. What has been happening in Constantinople? Bad stuff. So here's a quote from a man named Rui Gonzalez de Clavijo who visited Constantinople around 1403. He wrote this. Not going to do a Spanish accent. Though the circuit of the walls is thus very great and the area spacious, the city is not throughout very densely populated. There are within its compass many hills and valleys where cornfields and orchards are found. And among the orchard lands, there are hamlets and suburbs, which are all included within the city limits. Everywhere throughout the city, there are many great palaces, churches, and monasteries, but most of them are now in ruin. It is, however, plain that in former times, when Constantinople was in its pristine state, it was one of the noblest capitals of the world. They say even now that it holds within its circuit 3,000 churches, great and small. So the Romans are eking out an existence. Now they are, by the, by the start of the century, they are literally constrained to... Basically, the city limits of Constantinople, plus a an area called the Morea, which is now we call it the Peloponnese, but it's a, essentially a self-governing sort of district that's completely disconnected yeah. from Constantinople. Constantinople itself is isolated, alone, surrounded on all sides by the Ottomans. And it's, by the way, heavily depopulated. I mentioned before in the opening, actually, the last episode, that it went from having about anywhere between 500,000 and a million people within the city walls to around 50,000 people. Just to give you a kind of more real sense of the scale of that, it went from around the density of Manhattan, New York, to around the population density of Nottingham in the UK. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Don't be mean to Nottingham. All right. Um... London Borough Barnet. There you go. And the Romans know that they are exposed in that state. So there is a great debate in Roman society about how they should respond to this. 
And basically people come down into two camps. One side are the unionists, the people who want to unite with the rest of Christendom by unifying the Greek church and the, the Latin Roman church into one, the idea being that if you submit yourself to the Pope, you will become part of the Christian family once again, and they will come and liberate us, essentially. They will, they will, they will give us aid, and we'll be able to rebuild our empire. They will slaughter the fatted calf. Exactly. Now, the other faction are the anti-unionists, who say, quite reasonably, I would say, A, the last time we let them into the city, they killed almost everyone and took all of our stuff. Second of all, submitting to the authority of the Pope isn't just a question of theology. It's also an incredibly political decision and financial decision, because guess what the Pope has? He has tithes and he has his voracious... Medici bankers. If they submit to the papacy and unify the churches, they will erase what is left that is Roman about the Roman Empire. It will be extinction, essentially. Now, the Roman Emperor at the start of the 15th century was a guy by the name of Manuel II, who was sort of straddled the divide between the Unionists and anti-Unionists, but was very firmly of the position that they needed aid from the Christian world, and they needed it fast. So in 1400, Manuel set off on a sort of grand tour of European capitals, essentially begging on his knees for aid from the Christians. And we have quite moving accounts of sort of the, the, the Roman delegation arriving in, um, in London to visit Henry V. A guy called Adam of Usk observed the embassy that arrived from from. Constantinople, and he said that this emperor always walked with his men, dressed alike and in one colour, namely white, in long robes cut like tabards. I thought within myself what a grievous thing it was that this great Christian prince from the farther east should perforce be driven by unbelievers to visit the distant lands of the west and seek aid against them. So essentially, the man's on his the man's on his knees begging for help. And does he get it? Not particularly. No, he does not. And so Manuel returns to Constantinople embittered and miserable and basically spends the rest of his political career saying, the lands are not going to help us. Yeah. We're alone in the, we are alone in the world and we've been abandoned by Christendom. Anyway, Manuel eventually suffers a stroke and eventually dies, you know, you know, slightly, it's the whole, the whole thing is like, it's for quite a, sad. It's very, it's a very sad end, and it's a very sad state for the Roman Empire to be yeah. in, where you're touring these like, you know, the capitals of what to you are these smelly English upstarts begging them for money. Yeah, no, exactly. Essentially. It's a shame because you can imagine if you'd asked all of these monarchs to whom he appealed, would you rather have Constantinople be ruled by a Greek or a Muslim? They probably would have all agreed it was better to have Christians no matter what kind, but... But they were unwilling to actually do anything. Yeah, it's clear that didn't translate into action. It yeah. was clear that it was seen as kind of a not-my-problem. Exactly. And so eventually, Man when Manuel dies, power passes first to his eldest son, John, and then to his younger son, Constantine, who becomes Constantine the Eleventh, who is another incredibly important character in this story. We don't get a whole lot of a sense of Constantine as a character from the sources, but I think we can we can piece together a couple of things. One, politically he is more aligned with the Unionists and is resolutely anti-Turkish. Two, he never marries and never has kids. So I don't think he was a particular... I don't picture him as kind of a great womanizer. I mean, I did realize when I was doing the research, I don't think there's any sources where he ever even talks to a woman. <laughs> which I think is cool. And third, I think when I picture him, I, th I picture him as quite severe. He really gets portrayed as almost like a Marcus Aurelius sort of stoic yeah. type, I think. Yeah, stoic, unmoving, but utterly pig-headedly, resolutely determined. 
he has a, he has what he has going for him is not necessarily his charm or his charisma, but is unbreakable will. And you can see how that would be an asset because we've talked in the previous episode about how the Romans would kind of just if they thought their emperor wasn't really doing bits, just kind of coo him off and bring a new guy in. And yeah, you definitely had a lot of these populists kind of just getting ground through the system and then chucked out. And then you ended up with Constantine. Yeah. And so Constantine's main push in his, in his reign is to pursue the union of the churches. Now, as luck would have it, in the 1430s onwards, there was a great council being held. The council was initially held in Ferrera until there was an outbreak of plague, and suddenly they needed a place to keep all of these priests and somebody who'd be willing to pay for those priests to be kept. And of course, who else would step up but the the invertebrate <laughs> money man of, uh, of medieval Europe, the Medicis, who moved the thing to Florence? Of course, <laughs> because they are because they're in love with themselves. Yep, you can just imagine them being like, "We could just have it in Florence." <laughs> oh, but it's I don't want to inconvenience you guys. But my palazzo is pretty nice. Yeah, we just put it. We just put in some new marble in Florence. You know, we have towers in Florence. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so the so the the council gets moved to Florence and. Um, the emperor sends a guy named uh, Cardinal Isidori of Kiev to negotiate on behalf of the Roman Empire. And amazingly, an agreement is reached. And there is, the Pope and the, and the Roman Emperor agree for the first time in centuries to reunite the Christian churches. And this, hopefully, should pave the way to Constantinople getting military and political support. And hopefully breaking off the shackles of the Ottoman Empire. So Constantine, he's just scored this major diplomatic coup. And I imagine himself kind of feeling his oats a little bit. He feels like, okay, now we can now we can sort of push things a little bit. So remember Orhan from earlier, the, the Turkish prince who was being kept as a sort of glorified hostage. Constantine sends a letter. He sends ambassadors with a message for Mehmed. He says, Orhan, who is like your ruler Mehmed, a son of Osman, has reached the age of maturity. Every day many flock to him, calling him lord and proclaiming him ruler. He desires to display his munificence by making lavish gifts, but he has nowhere to stretch forth his hands. Demands cannot be made upon the emperor because he is not prosperous enough to comply with these demands. We offer you, therefore, one of two alternatives. Either double the annuity, or we will release Orhan. <laughs> release the hounds. Well, essentially, he's threatening to unleash a, a civil war. This is the card that he can play. Just to remind you, Mehmed, who's 18 at this point, has just taken the throne after a catastrophic first reign as a child. As much as on paper Orhan might not have a greater claim to the throne, you can imagine the Ottomans casting Mehmed aside pretty eagerly if a better, more mature, <laughs> more stable ruler presented himself. Yeah, you can imagine the sort of the various viziers going, hmm, should I go with the emotionally unstable twink <laughs> or the normal guy? <laughs> Yep. So the Romans arrive and they deliver this message to Mehmed, and his response is... Sick to your gut. <laughs> the meaning of which is lost to time. That's a joke for the Turks in the audience. <laughs> I've heard it's Turkish for, no thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'd really rather not. In sending that message to 
Mehmed, which he obviously, by the way, rejects immediately, in case that wasn't clear. The Romans have made a catastrophic fatal error. They've done two things. First of all, they've given Mehmed a pretext to break the peace treaty between the Ottomans and the Romans. Second of all, they have said to Mehmed, we are a threat. We are a liability. If you don't deal with us, we are going to continue to undermine your rule. So as long as the Roman Empire stands, and as long as Orhan is alive in Constantinople, Mehmed can never be secure. Yeah, and you can imagine how to the Romans, it didn't necessarily feel, you know, like a bad choice at the time to send this letter because there's not a lot of faith in Mehmed when he assumes the throne at the tender age of 18 or 19. And he's not shown that he's decisive. Yeah, and they were clearly thinking, okay, here's a guy who can be easily pushed around. Mm. Let's do just that. Maybe this is the start of the big Roman comeback. What they didn't account for <laughs> was Mehmed. <laughs> Mehmed, perhaps because he had such a disastrous first reign, is just, his his response is, oh, okay, you want to do that? Well, I'm going to come and burn down your entire house. Yeah, which it's it's interesting to imagine that there probably is an alternate timeline where the Sultan wasn't this brash 18-year-old, you know, guy who who was, you know, just willing to kind of roll with the punches and punch back. Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a brilliant exchange because the that speaks to exactly that point, which is that before they meet with Mehmed, the the Roman emissaries, they tell the Grand Vizier what they're going to say to him. And he's, he literally says, listen, the previous sultan was a kind, conscientious friend to you. And to quote, the present sultan is not of the same disposition. <laughs> so he's desperately trying to give them an out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they just go, and they go through with it. And that is the moment when all the wheels start to spring into motion and conflict, final existential conflict, do or die for both parties, becomes inevitable. Because even though Mehmed isn't just going to capitulate to the Romans, the significance of this threat of a civil war is not lost on him. It's very real. It's absolutely easy to imagine that this could bring down the empire. The geopolitical wheel of the 15th century turns pretty slowly. Mm -hmm. It takes months for messages to be passed back and forth. It takes a long time to rally troops. It takes a long time to make significant military decisions. So Mehmed doesn't set out right away. No, it takes about, the it, there's about a two year buildup. But the main thing that he does do, which is incredibly important, is he starts constructing on the Asian side of the Bosphorus within sight of Constantinople, a fortress. This fortress was known in, in Turkish as the Rumeli Hirasi, or the Fortress of Rumelia, but in Greek it was simply called the, the Throat, throat cutter. cutter. So this is this fortress had giant cannons on the walls which would shoot down any ship that passed through the Bosphorus that didn't pay taxes to the Sultan, essentially throttling trade to Constantinople. From the Black Sea. Yeah, this is not an idle threat either, because they actually do make good on their word, and they do sink a Venetian ship uh, that was trying to make its way south towards Constantinople. And this is also, should be mentioned, joins another fortress that was built by one of Mehmed's forebears on the other side. So they've got these two fortresses basically right across from each other on the water. You're not getting around them. No, so Constantinople was built to control the Bosphorus, and now it doesn't basically. And he's also consolidating his military power. Mehmed, he's writing to his vassals, the vassal states, some of whom are Muslim, some of whom are Christian, and he's consolidating his military might. And in the meantime, he also quashes a few sort of small rebellions. So he basically hits the ground running mm -hmm. and kind of starts proving himself right away. Yeah, this war machine starts in the sort of very slow process of medieval war, starts building up capacity. Now, in the meantime, the Romans, they know they really messed up. And so immediately the emperor is frantically sending these messages um, to all the sort of the princes and the pope, all the people who, people who 
said that they would come through in time of need, basically saying, oh god, <laughs> it's, hap it's actually happening. You need to, like, take this seriously. Oops. <laughs> now, as the Crusades in 1396 and 1444 had proven, getting to Constantinople through the Ottoman Empire from Europe and over land was basically impossible. So the best way for any force that wanted to help Constantinople out was a sea attack. You could, If you came up through the Mediterranean from the south, you would bypass the throat cutter, bypass the entire Ottoman army, and arrive at the gates of Constantinople basically um, unmolested. And there's only one power in the late medieval Mediterranean that has the ships, the capacity, and the money to do something like this. And that is, of course, Venice. So the Venetian Balio, basically the, the consulate of Venice in Constantinople, sends a message to the Doge of Venice, basically saying, we Venetians in Constantinople have chosen to die with the Romans. Please come save us. <laughs> so that doesn't happen. And the Doge receives this letter. And he, he looks it over, possibly even in the same office, where Enrico decided to launch the Fourth Crusade. And you know what he chooses to do? He chooses to go to war. Ooh. Orders are sent out to the shipyards of Venice to start building a great fleet, and the Venetian bankers are ordered to sort of start hiring mercenaries because Venice doesn't have a standing army. The gears start turning, and to possibly the shock of everyone involved, the Serene Republic readies for war. So in spring 1453, Mehmed's army is assembled in uh, the Ottoman capital of Erdin and starts marching towards Constantinople. Now in this army are all sorts. You have the elite Janissaries, who are basically warriors raised from birth to make war. Many of whom are enslaved Christians, by mm -hmm. the way. Most, I'd Most say. Most of whom. Um, you have, but you also have uh, engineers. You have the legendary Orban, the Hungarian engineer who promised Mehmed that he could build a cannon powerful enough to shake the walls of Babylon. And they have the cannon with them. It has taken... Uh, months and months to make, and it allegedly requires, what, something like a hundred oxen to drag 40 it? Forty wagons and a hundred oxen to carry it to Constantinople. And it has, you know, presumably, they're bringing along as well, of course, all sorts of other artillery, dozens and dozens of cannons of various sizes, and of course all of the cannonballs needed, the ones shot by this giant cannon built by Orban, which is known, by the way, as Basilic are apparently 600 pound <sighs> spheres of stone that could be launched up to a mile by the cannon. A man could climb around in the barrel very easily. Yes. And by the way, um, early modern and medieval cannons, these are like monsters. These are like animals. <laughs> They're like living things because mm. they are feisty. They are finicky. They require massive amounts of gunpowder. You know, and they're he they're absolutely huge because we're still living in the age of these big walled fortifications, an age that is slowly being ended by the existence of extremely powerful artillery. And all of this is being dragged to Constantinople. Mm -hmm. And it's not just Turks, I should say, in um, in the Ottoman army. You also have a large contingent of Serbs from from the despotate of Serbia which is an Ottoman client state at this stage. And we have a great anecdote from one of the Serbian engineers who, uh, who joined the, 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 in this enormous procession. Yes, um, I should mention, this was presented to me as a diary. I think he might have written it after the fact and written it as a diary, because um, <laughs> people love their little framing devices. Mm -hmm. um, but We'd never do something like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But one thing that's also interesting that we have an account of is that Mehmed, potentially not wanting word to get out that, you know, Judgment Day was fast approaching, actually didn't tell his armies where exactly they were marching to. <laughs> and well, yeah, because if you say, we're going to go and take the unconquerable city, 
Yeah, exactly. And it just became clear along the way at some point that they were marching on Constantinople. So we have a great quote from this guy who says, Our party left Novo Bordeaux at sunrise this morning as we rode. A curious thought came to mind. How might I, being a minor, be of use to the Turkish emperor? <laughs> How indeed. How indeed. Intriguing. <laughs> but of course, the it's not just... Mehmet, who is gathering his armies. The Romans are calling on every favor, pulling every string, emptying their coffers for what they correctly understand to be do-or-die time. This could be the one that gets us. And they assemble a pretty impressive crew of their own. So the Roman army at this point is about a thousand people strong, most people estimate, which is a tiny amount. Beyond that, there's a census that the emperor asks to be done um, to sort of figure out how many fighting men he has in reserve, and he gets he gets that number presented to him by by his close friend, who then attests that the emperor looked appalled <laughs> and terrified and told him never to share that information. Um, but we think it's about five thousand men in Constantinople yeah. able to bear arms. Yeah, and there's you know a, a larger contingent of. Basically everyone who's able to throw a rock, because that's the nice thing about being under siege. When push comes to shove, it will be everyone's job to fight yeah. back should the need arise. Yeah, so women and children are absolutely involved in the, in the fighting that is to come. And you should imagine that when you picture what happens next. And Constantine has a few people he's brought in from around Europe. So one of those is a guy who's known as John Grant. Yes, a legendary, um, well, this, the contemporary sources call him German, but to me, I agree with the more recent historiography, which suggests that he was in fact Scottish. Because people from all over Northern Europe and the Anglo-Saxon sphere were referred to as Germans mm -hmm. by a lot of medieval sources. And so it is generally agreed upon, it's more likely that he was Scottish. So in some sources he's called Johannes Grant, but in many sources it's been tran translated as John Grant. And this is my show, so he's Scottish. And he is definitely <laughs> Scottish. <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, and he's a sort of master of mining and countermining and tunnel combat, shall we say. Nobody quite knows where he comes from or what sort of contingent he's in, but he, he shows up in all of the sources, so we know he's there. Another guy who's part of Constantine's contingent is possibly the embodiment of swag. <laughs> <laughs> I mean this. His name is Giovanni Justiniani. Giovanni Justiniani de Longo. He's from a, a, an aristocratic um, Genovese family. He's a, he's a condottieri. So he's an Italian mercenary, and he's a master of siege warfare. And he's possibly formerly a pirate. Yes. He's a <laughs> swashbuckling gentleman <laughs> pirate. And I put If emphasis, anybody in this story is a Ghazi, it's him. Yes. And I put emphasis on his charisma because it's repeatedly attested in sources that just having this guy around boosted morale for the entire Roman army because he's a master <laughs> strategist. He just sounds really cool. Huzzah! Yeah, yes! Exactly. All right, chaps, let's get ready to climb those walls. And he was, in fact, so cool that Aha. Constantine basically put him in charge, I think, yeah. defending the walls. So I think yeah. it probably would have been more like, a uh, hot chaps, let's get ready to pour he didn't... boiling oil down the walls. <laughs> he didn't get along with everybody, so Luacas Notaras, who is the mega duke of the Roman Empire, so the admiral of an empire that doesn't have an, a navy anymore, absolutely loathed <laughs> this man. And there are a, there are consistent accounts throughout the um, throughout the siege that was to come of them just bickering constantly. They hated each other. I like to think he was just seething at how like effortly charismatic yeah. this, this swashbuckling Italian nobleman is. But he is also a mercenary, and he brings with him his company of mercenaries. And so there is, of course, you know, some suspicion about the merits and downsides of fighting with mercenaries. Another character who's, who is in the army defending Constantinople is Orhan Chalebi, who mist I would say mystifyingly sticks around. Yeah. 
I think it's fast. The fact that he doesn't flee as soon as word reaches them that the army is coming is fascinating because if anybody is not going to survive a victorious Ottoman siege, it will be Orhan. Yeah, because the thing, the thing to do as a dispossessed medieval noble was just wash up in some foreign court <laughs> and hang out as just a kind of random courtier. And surely that would be preferable to whatever was going to come next. Probably horrible, excruciating death. And Orhan brings with him, you know, his entire entourage of Turkish warriors. So when you imagine the defenders of Constantinople, you should imagine, basically... Greek priests and women fighting back to back with Italian mercenaries and Turkish warriors. Oh, and by the way, Dracula's gay younger brother is possibly also there. I keep reading sources that say he was. I couldn't find a reliable. Like, Wait, on which side? First, per on on the Ottoman side. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, so you know. Um, I keep finding sources that say he was probably there, but I can't find a good first-hand source. He doesn't seem to do anything. I in think he's probably just around to, like, sit in uh, Mehmed's tent and cuddle. Yeah, and, like, you know, eat locum and <laughs> <laughs> bathe in rose water. <laughs> no, definitely. Because, like, all of it's the... Like, you know what it is? You know that onion article that's like, these gays are too precious to serve in the Yes! <laughs> How many soldiers is a gay man's life worth? <laughs> Seven. So on April 5th, this enormous Ottoman army, which outnumbers the defenders of Constantinople 10 to 1, it arrives outside the walls and Mehmed issues, as was required by the, the decrees of Sharia, the same ultimatum that Bayezid offered to the Roman cities. We have the text of that ultimatum, which reads, Are you willing to abandon the city and depart for wherever you like? together with your nobles and their property, leaving behind the common people unharmed by both us and by you? Or do you wish that through your resistance, the common people should be enslaved by the Turks and scattered all over the world? And Constantine's response is blunt and fairly short and ends with, To surrender the city to you is beyond my authority or anyone else in it. Like I said, it iron will, dogged determination. Yeah, because I think it's worth it to bring up that at, by no means is the fall, as it's called, of Constantinople a foregone conclusion at this point. Because as we mentioned before, sieging is hard work. It's really hard to keep morale up, especially when the people inside of the city are fighting for their lives. Mm -hmm. All they have to do is kind of outlast you when they don't have any other options, whereas you need to keep all of your men who could be warm and comfortable and probably eating food that's a lot nicer at home, <laughs> you have to keep their morale up yeah. and keep them fighting. And that's not an easy thing to do. Nevertheless, I think people have wondered why Constantine didn't capitulate at that point, considering the state of his army and the state of his, quote, empire and the city itself. And I think, I think we just have to kind of accept that that wasn't the type of person he no. was. Well, I think there's two things going on in his head. I think, first of all, on a pragmatic note, you know, let's look at, let's look at, as you say, let's look at the sort of the, the landscape from a, from a Roman point of view. You have these enormous walls that have stood for a thousand years and never fallen. You have the great chain across the Golden Horn, which gives you something that very, very, very few besieged cities have, which is a, f a fresh food source, because you can still fish in the Golden Horn because no ships can come in. You have 
mercenaries and warriors from all over Europe who are experts in siege warfare, and you have a new alliance with, with the Latin powers of the West who could come and relieve you any day now. It's not an irrational gamble to make. And the second reason why I think he doesn't take it is because I think he sees himself as an actor in history. He would have been aware of the, of the prophecy of how Constantinople falls, that when the armies of Islam look like they're about to break through the walls and take the city and all hope is lost, the last Roman emperor will draw his sword and drive the enemy back. And I think on some level he thinks that's him. Absolutely. I think he has to think it's him. Because yeah, that's true. <laughs> he's not left with a lot of other no. options. And so, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a tricky one, you know, for Mehmed, even considering his resources. He's going to have to strike hard and yeah. fast. Because if he doesn't, he also is in for the job. Like, he needs this to work. This is his big gamble um, to cement his power. And he's also being, you know, kind of pushed and pulled in different directions by his viziers, some of whom are saying, yes, Mehmed, do it. And some of whom are saying, I don't know, Mehmed, maybe not right now. <laughs> and he, you know, clearly wants to make staffing decisions about who's going to be kept on the payroll and who is going to be um, put on the head roll, as they say. <laughs> um, but before he starts kind of, you know, solidifying who's actually allowed into his inner circle and who's going to be part of his royal court. He needs to establish himself as the leader. And so I think in a sense, he's also very much trying to stick it to everyone who during his first reign pushed him around and disenfranchised him. And, you know, perhaps rightfully because he was 12. <laughs> I think he definitely feels the, the kind of presence of that first reign mm. and of what's happened. Yeah. And so I think you have two, the two people who were able to avoid this have really no option but to push on with it. Yep. And so, you know, on the, on the 5th of April, uh, Constantine rejects the offer of surrender. And on the 6th of April, the cannons start firing. So from the 6th of April onwards the Ottoman cannons are pounding the walls of Constantinople, including Orban's monstrosity, Basilic. And this is, and you know, this is the, if you were standing in Constantinople and experiencing that, you would have felt like the world was ending, like the sky is filled with smoke and the, the ground is shaking underneath you. And these, these ancient walls that were Construction on these walls started when there were still legionaries in Britain. So these ancient, ancient walls that were built in a different epoch and have been sanctified by the power of the Virgin Mary for a millennium, when faced with the titanic power of the gunpowder age, these ancient walls hold somehow against all the odds it's incredible and we have accounts that there that Ju justiniani the charismatic genoese who's extremely experienced in siege warfare apparently tells the romans when the cannons knock holes in the walls to fill the holes with rubble and this actually has an incredible effect on the impact of the cannon fire that the Ottomans didn't foresee, which is that these massive piles of rubble actually absorb shock <laughs> extremely well. And so actually it slowly renders the cannon fire ineffective, although they do keep firing. And there's accounts of how this massive cannon basilic fairly sort of par for the course for cannons of that age of that size. It fired and it basically delivered what Orban said it was going to deliver but this thing was you know it was not always reliable it needed I think it said to be like the barrel needed to be constantly slathered in oil to keep it cool because the metal was so thick it was really prone to cracking it could apparently only be fired 
once every three hours, which is not an amazing <laughs> sort of rate. And apparently, I mean, you can just imagine being in the vicinity of this thing while it was firing would have been absolutely terrifying because cannons of that age, regardless of their size, were also very prone to exploding um, into, you know, a sort of, you know... Shrapnel. Into, into shrapnel. <laughs> and... We're told that uh, eventually this probably happened with Basilic. How exactly it went out of commission, we don't know. But at some point during the siege, it possibly exploded. And possibly, possibly killed Orban. <laughs> just cracked open, and most likely Orban was killed um, by cannon shrapnel during this siege. What a way to go out. Yes, but before that happened, it was absolutely hammering the walls of Constantinople with these titanic, titanic cannonballs. So the, so the Ottomans realize they're not getting anywhere fast. They need a new strategy. And so these Serbian miners are ordered to start undermining the walls. What does that mean? Well, if undermining was a classic siege technique where you would dig essentially a long tunnel so you were underneath the walls of the, of the enemy castle. And then you would set off explosives at that point, and the earth would sort of collapse, like a collapsing foundation, and bring the walls down with them. Now, the Romans watching this, they see these sort of these tunnels being dug. There's not an awful lot they can do to stop the, the Serbians digging, because the tunnels are starting beyond where their artillery and their arrows can reach. They can, however, dig their own tunnels. And they listen as well, apparently. Yes, so this is, this is what you would do if you were trying to countermine somebody, is you, could, you would fill barrels with water, and then you could track the, the vibrations of the digging underground, um, and then dig your own tunnel and intercept the enemy. Which, uh, again, imagine that as a, as a moment where you sort of... You, you're a Serbian miner trying to breach the walls of Constantinople, and then your your shovel hits the gr the hits the earth, and it doesn't in fact lead to more dirt, but in fact the wall caves down, and there's just this army of Romans behind the there's door. There's a giant Scottish yes, guy. <laughs> because the guy in charge of this was John Grant. He was he was he was put in charge of uh, counter mining efforts. You, I mean, you can very easily imagine him going around like. All right, you lazy Italian bastards! You bound the hordes of hell are upon ye! You bound to start dead for your life! You know, the dirt we've got in Scotland is much better than this dirt! <laughs> it's got better minerals! Hey, right, have you birds heard the proclaimers? Aye, the boys that proclaim the king when he opens parliament! Aye! Our class. <laughs> Do you like run rig? You know the farming method. <laughs> What's another arcane Scottish reference? Uh, how do you guys feel about sturgeon? <laughs> <laughs> What do you think of sturgeon and salmon? Either my two favorite types of fish. <laughs> And not only are you facing this gigantic bellowing Scotsman under the, un, for, you know, in hand-to-hand -hand combat under the walls of Constantinople, but he's got a secret weapon. Because the Romans may have lost a lot, but one thing they haven't lost is the... Mama's uh, secret recipe. <laughs> the sec Mama's secret recipe for <laughs> Greek fire, which is essentially napalm you can spray out of a flamethrower. So imagine, again... What happens to a bunch of Serbian miners when a, ta a colossal bellowing Scotsman l fires a flamethrower at point-blank range in a tunnel? Especially because what we know went down from first-hand accounts is that they managed to find and countermine some of these tunnels, and then allegedly John Grant captured two Serbian miners and tortured them until they revealed the locations of the other tunnels, at which point they napalmed them. So imagine Listen, they, pa listen, pal. Imagine... This'll be... This'll go a lot smoother. Imagine, you know, digging into the darkness 
And you just hear, like, a match strike. <laughs> I mean, it's not a great way to go out. No, absolutely not. But also, just, like, from a storytelling point of view, it is kind of amazing that there was a flamethrower toting Scotsman battling through the tunnels under Constantinople. Yeah, you guys are not beating the allegations. <laughs> donkey! No, I'm talking to my donkey! <laughs> So the undermining uh, thing is really not going to plan. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. And so, you know, and so... And and the, the Romans are fighting back pretty acutely. We also have accounts that Giovanni Justiniani would lead um, these raiding parties to the Ottoman camps, which were apparently extremely effective. I think they were gradually abandoned because apparently they had quite high death um, tolls on I can't side. imagine why. <laughs> but yeah, imagine, you know, this Italian guy just sweeping through your camp with his band of marauding mercenaries. Aha! Justiniani has never been touched by a blade. <laughs> exactly. Who's your favorite fearless hero? It is me! Ha <laughs> ha! Huzzah! And it goes from bad to worse for Mehmed. In one of the most humiliating experiences of the entire siege that happens a few weeks afterwards. So, a few weeks into the siege, four ships are seen sailing up the Golden Horn. Three Genovese galleys filled to the brim with weapons and food and an imperial transport ship laden with grain. And Mehmed, of course, turns to his, his admiral. Do you know the line? And Mehmed says, sink those ships or don't come back alive. So a hundred Turkish ships are bearing down on these four little galleys. We should have mentioned that before. By the way, the Turkish <laughs> people have loads of ships and they're, they're all basically parked outside the Golden Horn. So there are a hundred ships bearing down on, on these four galleys. But the wind is with the Christians and so they are just slicing through the water as fast as they can go. And the slower Turkish ships can't keep up. And, and the defenders of Constantinople are standing at the gates, waiting to lower the great chain so they can slip on through. But suddenly the wind changes, and the Genovese ships are left become, in the middle of the Bosphorus, surrounded by Turkish vessels. And immediately they sort of descend. Well, in fact, the Turkish vessels ascend, because what they've got to do in order to kind of overcome these ships is basically throw up their grappling hooks or whatever and climb up. And so this fierce battle ensues that's almost like a miniature version of a siege because yes. you have these Ottoman sailors trying to climb up and slash and hack their way, but it's a tough battle. It's a tough thing to do. you got to climb up the side of a boat. While Italians are trying to kill you. And not only are they hacking at you with swords and axes and everything that they've got, they also wheel out these enormous wrecking balls attached like that are tied to the end of cranes and they just swing them out and just pulverize the sides of Turkish ships and like men and limbs and wood is flying everywhere and the sea looks like it's boiling and it's starting to turn red. This goes on for four hours. Horrifying. Until the wind changes and the ships quickly speed away past the, the great chain and into the golden horn to the ecstatic cheers of the defenders. This is very bad news for Mehmed because the siege has already been going on for a few weeks by now. They've taken some Romans out, they've made some gains, but not many, and they've been countered, you know, at quite a few turns by the Romans. So... You can imagine at this point, the pressure is mounting for Mehmed to either make a move or to call the siege off. If you were a defender on the northern sea walls of Constantinople on the 22nd of April, 
you would have seen something very strange. You would have looked over the, over the Golden Horn to the Thracian hills beyond, and you would have seen a couple of what looks like long sticks slowly rising up over the horizon. And then you would have seen the body of a ship rising up over the horizon. And then you would have seen something even more impossible, which is a ship sailing over the land. And you would have watched pretty much in horror as this ship seemed to glide so gracefully across the ground and then effortlessly splash down into the Golden Horn. And then you would have seen another ship do that, and another ship, and another ship, and another ship, until there are 60 ships in your harbor. 60 Ottoman ships. Shit. <laughs> so Mehmed, never one to back down from a challenge, doesn't take this, um, this defeat with the Genoese ships lightly, but he pulls out what could be described as a very old technique, but still an absolutely ingenious one to bring out. And definitely no small amount of effort is put into this. But he fells trees in the land next to the Golden Horn, and has these trees stripped down into logs, and creates a road of logs over which these ships are rolled, the Ottoman ships. So around, across, bypassing the, the chain entirely and putting the Ottoman ships into the safe haven of Constantinople, into the Golden Horn. It has two consequences. First of all, it means that they can't fish in the Golden Horn anymore. Second of all, it means that whilst up until now the Ottomans have had to focus their attacks and their focus their fire on the much stronger western land walls of the city, now they can attack the much weaker much smaller sea walls at the same time. So now you're fighting on two fronts. And so this is absolutely devastating to the Romans, who a few nights later, on the 28th of April, try to launch a counterattack to try to destroy these Ottoman ships. And not only do they fail, but Mehmed, to taunt them, has a whole bunch of prisoners from the Romans impaled on spikes outside of the city walls. So that's where they got the idea from. <laughs> <laughs> Mystery solved. And despite this pretty catastrophic loss that the Romans have just suffered, the fighting doesn't stop there. It rages on for almost another month. And the Ottomans are sending waves and waves of soldiers, including these fierce slave warriors, the Janissaries, to launch assaults on the walls. And the assaults are being pushed back by the Roman forces, including people led by Giovanni Justiniani. And it's pretty bloody, and the whole time there are viziers and officials who are telling Mehmed, you know, now might be the right time to turn back, you know, maybe we should give up this whole Constantinople thing. Uh, but Mehmed's pretty determined. And well, because if he goes home, defeated, yeah. after putting together this whole operation... Well, that will just be the start of the losses for him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, on the 21st of May, 1453... Mehmed gives Emperor Constantine one more chance to surrender. And Constantine refuses, telling Mehmed, All of us have reached the mutual decision to die of our own free will, without any regard for our lives. Defiant to the, to the bitter end. And the bitter end, indeed, is not far away at this point. On the 26th of May, Mehmed gathers his war council and decides that one final assault should be made on the city with everything that they've got to overwhelm the exhausted Romans and def other defenders. And they gave themselves two days to prepare for this. Meanwhile, uh, in Constantinople, word reaches the emperor that there is no Venetian fleet on the horizon. The Romans are alone in the world for their final days. On the night of the 28th of May, a grand mass is held in the church of Hagia Sophia. It brings together clergy from all sides of the spectrum, 
Catholics and anti-unionist Orthodox pray together one final time. It's also said that that night, the strange red lights were seen dancing in the sky and that the people of Constantinople interpreted this to mean that God was abandoning them and they would have to face their fate on their own. Around midnight on the 29th of May, the final Ottoman assault begins. There are three waves of soldiers. The first of these are Serbians who get almost instantly pincushioned and get all, nowhere near the walls. The second wave of more, of more experienced Turkish irregulars make it a bit further and manage to put up a few siege ladders which are knocked back by the Roman defenders. The third and final wave are the Janissaries who make it over the walls and start the battle in earnest. And from this point on, the sources we have are extraordinarily partial. <laughs> and by that I mean they're, they are incomplete, but also they are very partisan. Yes. And so figuring out what happens next is of a fool's game. All we kind of have are fragments. So one thing it's alleged that happens is that Giovanni Justiniani leads his men for one last charge to fight, try to fight back the Ottomans. And it's said that he's mortally wounded and dragged off the battlefield, where he'll die a few days later. Yeah, a lot of Greek sources say that um, he was just a coward who fled, but he did die. He definitely so died. I don't, I, I, I don't put a lot of weight on that. I don't think he... There's no way I think he would have fled, because this is a man who's been staring down death for the past six weeks. If he was going to flee... He yeah. would have done so a long time ago. Well, he didn't have to come in the first place. Exactly. What happens to Orhan Chalebi is equally confusing. Um, he, we know he dies, but nobody knows how. Some people say that he finds the he climbs the tallest tower in Constantinople and throws himself off of it. Others say that he's caught trying to escape disguised as a Turkish soldier. Whatever happens, he's found dead, and his his severed head will be presented to Mehmed. As dawn breaks over Constantinople, word reaches the other mercenaries that Justiniani is gone, and essentially their meal ticket is their, their meal ticket is gone, so there's no reason for them to stay. And there is a sudden rout of of the defenders. Meanwhile, in the Imperial Palace, Constantine the Eleventh watches his city burn watches the defenders flee, and he realizes that the city is lost. Now, according to the Greek tradition, Constantine then turns to his men, the last soldiers in the Roman Empire, and says, As my city falls, I will fall with it. Whoever wishes to escape, let him save himself if he can. Whoever is ready to face death, follow me! He tears off his imperial regalia and draws his sword and leads the last of his men in one final doomed charge. Nobody knows how the emperor died. The Ottomans claim that he died a hero's death defending his city. The Greek tradition sees things a little differently. There is a legend that Constantine XI never died. Instead, the second before he was about to be stabbed by a Janissary's blade, he was touched by an angel who turned him to marble and buried him under the golden gate of Constantinople. The Greeks say, when God wishes to restore Constantinople, a great ox will bellow, and the marble emperor will rise from his grave to reconquer his city and drive the Turks back to the steppes of Asia. As is customary, 
three days of pillaging ensue in which the Ottoman forces ransack Constantinople. So they loot, they murder, they enslave, they rape, and after three days, Mehmed enters the city. And I think he's devastated by what he sees. In the months after the siege, he summons Luakas Notaras, who's the sort of the highest ranking surviving Roman official. And he sort of angrily demands, why did you not convince the emperor to, to surrender? Why look at, look at what has happened to this place because of your refusal to capitulate. So I think even in victory, he's kind of haunted by Constantine in a strange kind of way. This poor city has had so much happen to it. It's been, it's been the center of the world, and then it's been violently, you know, destroyed by the Fourth Crusade, and and now this. And there's a story about Mehmed entering the Hagia Sophia, isn't there, and seeing an Ottoman soldier trying to loot something, from trying to altar. pry one of the, trying to pry one of the flagstones out of the floor. That's it. And he just guts him. You guys have done enough. And then he wa and then after that he walks up to the altar of Hagia Sophia. He pushes it aside, and he performs his Friday prayers. And from that point onwards, Hagia Sophia is a mosque. After the siege, he sort of goes on a tour around the city, including the moldering, decaying uh, palace of the emperor. And he's said to have walked reverently through the halls and. He's said to have uh, muttered to himself this fragment of poetry. The spider weaves the curtains in the palace of the Caesars. The owl calls the watches in the towers of Afrasiab. You can imagine, like, you know, him kind of, like, elbowing one of his viziers or something and being like, hey, write this down. And then being like, but make sure you say that, like, I muttered it reverently. <laughs> Because that was the kind of person he was. Yeah. He was acutely aware of his place in history. Yes. He was the original poster. He was a he was a real, like, he was both a sort of learned and spiritual man, but also somebody who was very, it was very important to him that everybody knew he was learned and spiritual. Exactly. He would have had a Twitter, like one of those return Twitter accounts. Oh, yes, absolutely. But this moment is... His moment, even though it is this bittersweet moment, it is a moment of utter triumph for him. Like, this consolidates him as the most successful and the most revered of all of the Ottoman sultans. And I think you can see this if you read the endowment on the Hagia Sophia um, mosque. It says, By the highest name of Allah and his most lofty name, conquest and prosperity are achieved. By the grace of Allah, may this undeniable conquest accompany the exalted sultan. May the pillars of his rule be enduring and endless, with days of eternal and boundless majesty. May his days of grandeur never cease nor end. Of course, many of the Roman defenders of the city survived, but they were in a curious position because with the fall of Constantine, the Roman Empire was no more. And they had to figure out a way of being whoever they were without being Roman for the first time in the hist in in a, in almost two thousand years. Thankfully, Mehmed wasn't too keen on displacing them. In fact, he was quite invested in keeping them right where they were. And in fact, the Greek-speaking population of Constantinople actually increases in the ten years after fourteen fifty-three. This is why actually Mehmed wasn't like a conservative return guy, because if he heard the phrase forced diversity, he would have been like, yes, <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> More different kinds of men. <laughs> yes. Even though he was, you know, very devoutly Muslim, he was also very keen on building this multi-ethnic, multicultural empire and on preserving the identities of these different groups within the city and the empire. I mean, he appointed guys to be the heads of the different religious groups. So he appointed like a chief rabbi, essentially, and a chief Christian priest, who were both people who he apparently thought very highly of. There's a quote I was reading about the chief rabbi where Mehmed said, oh, I went like disguised as a peasant to watch him, <laughs> you know, deliver like judgments and arbitrations. And I thought there could not possibly be anyone of sounder moral character than this guy. 
Yeah, and I think that speaks to a wider thing about uh, Mehmed, which is that he he was genuinely invested in the idea of Constantinople. And his I think that in his mind, he was not trying to destroy something. He was trying to restore Constantinople. And in many ways, I think he did. I think, like you say, he restored the cosmopolitanism and the diversity of the city um, with, with his policies. He restored the wealth of the city. And, of course, in a, I think, quite a strange twist of fate, he also restored Constantinople as an incredibly important cultural center. Because, of course, all this time the Renaissance has been going on, which was, in a, in a cruel irony, was in many ways triggered by the exodus of Greek scholars following the Fourth Crusade. He brings much of that learning back. He endows vast cultural projects and translations of great works and great works of art. And by the way, you know, the, the Greeks are involved in this as well. They are also, you know engaging in this renaissance like you it's very easy to get bogged down in the debate of you know what was the renaissance did it happen who had a renaissance but i think it's pretty clear to me that one place that did have a renaissance was constantinople under mehmed and his successors the city was restored to its former glory Absolutely. I mean, Mehmed was one of those guys who always had, like, you know, three or four poets in his retinue. <laughs> and he could just snap his fingers and be like, poetry man, read me a poem. And, um, yeah, there's all sorts of records of how much this guy just absolutely adored. You know, I think he's, it's hard to, it, it's almost like feels hard to say about someone who lived close to 600 years ago, who was an Ottoman sultan. But, like, it is kind of endearing reading about how enthusiastic this guy was he was a nerd for all of these different you know cultures and for all sorts of art and scholarship and you know things that you could say were the the substrate of a progressive forward-thinking society i think that's rad i agree quote of course Mehmed wasn't just interested in emulating the Roman Empire. He saw himself as Roman. He saw himself as not the destroyer of Rome, but simply as, just as Constantine had been the first Christian emperor, he would be the first Muslim emperor. And so he has the, the patriarch of Constantinople proclaim him Basileus, which was the old Greek term for the Roman emperor. And there's a Roman scholar named George of Trebizond, who in 1466 is quoted as having said to Mehmed, The seat of the Roman Empire is Constantinople. Therefore you are the legitimate emperor of the Romans. And he who is and remains emperor of the Romans is also emperor of the whole earth. Well, with that, with a heavy heart, it's time to bid farewell to Constantinople, to Mehmed and Constantine and John Grant and all the other eccentric characters that we've met on this shockingly long journey that we've been on. I um, know. I'm going to I'm going to miss it. I well, we will return. We will. I, I. I mean, Constantinople will return as a as a setting, and and characters will return. I'm sure in future episodes, uh, because it is as we've talked about, just such a central part of the medieval world. But this has been a an absolute pleasure to make um, with you, Olivia. It's just been so much fun, and. Uh, that's so much work. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad that we've had a positive response to the first episode. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode as well, because... It's much more exciting this time. Yeah, I mean, it felt like it was all just really bringing it together, and it was so much fun to put together. And I have to say, I never would have made a two-part podcast episode about Constantinople if it weren't for you, Aaron, and your enthusiasm about this incredibly fascinating, dynamic, culturally rich city and all of the freaky little guys that have inhabited it. So So now can I ask you, with a straight face, look me in the eye. Do you get it now? I, I, I understand everything. There you go, folks. All right. Well, you know where to find us? I am at Aaron P. Tappers on Twitter. I'm at Weird Medieval, or my personal account is at Olivia underscore underscore MS. And yeah, this has been the Weird Medieval Guys podcast. We'll see you in two weeks. We're going woke. Peace out. We're going to go see the beekeeper. (laughs) (laughs) I can't wait to see Jason Statham kill people with bees. Anyway, smash cut to... Sorry, you're sitting on the Oh, no. No, it's tied to... No. What? Oh, no, it's tied to your foot. Yeah. You are Tangled from the movie Tangled. That's my favorite character from the movie Tangled. Yeah, Tangled. I like it when she gets tangled. (laughs) Stupid. (laughs) Note how in the movie Tangled, (coughs) nothing gets tangled. Her hair stays totally straight. Like, my hair would get tangled. Hers is way long. Anyways. Yeah, but she's like a blonde with, like, TikTok hair. So yeah, you're funny. right, actually. That movie's much older than TikTok. That was a bad joke. Shit. It, it, that movie's, like, ten years old. Okay. Hey, you want to say something fun? Two years from now, Moana will be ten years old. You know what? Two years from Moana now... Moana came out yesterday. Two years from now, Frozen will be twenty years old. Fuck you. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you remember... Only 90s kids will remember Frozen. Anyways, anyways, what has been happening?